In this video, we're going to talk about cardiogenic shock and how we end up with having profound hypotension in someone who is in cardiogenic shock. So we're going to talk about cardiogenic shock from the perspective of myocardial infarction. About 5 to 10% of patients experiencing uh, myocardial infarction are going to experience cardiogenic uh, shock. So we'll use this as kind of our uh, starting point to outline, well, how does cardiogenic shock happen? So in myocardial infarction, obviously, we're talking about an occlusion of a vessel that's going to lead to prolonged ischemia of the tissues. Now, this can happen in anyone who's having dying or, or a dying ventricle or destruction of the ventricle. Myocardial infarction is a good example of this because it happens over such a rapid rate. So when we look at MI, what's happening is we have occlusion of the vessel, which is leading to pretty rapid ischemia to the myocardial tissues and then infarction of the myocardial tissues. You can see this death happening over a long term in patients who have uh, cardiovascular disease and end up with something like congestive heart failure. Their heart is con progressively failing over time. It's a more long term progression towards cardiogenic shock. When we're looking at someone having myocardial infarction, typically it's a more rapid progression to cardiogenic shock as we're seeing the lack of blood flow leading to a uh, first ischemia, and then infarction of the tissue. So as you can see, we now have a left ventricle that has been severely infarcted. And in order to have an idea of what, what's happening or why that's a big problem, we have to look at what our cardiac output uh, is defined by. So you know, cardiac output is de defined by heart rate times stroke volume. When we look at stroke volume, we can break it down into our preload, our afterload, and contractility. And what's happening here in someone who's having a big uh, myocardial infarction is their contractility is greatly impaired. So as we have infarction of the uh, ventricular tissue and we are no longer able to have contraction and output, contractility is impaired, which is going to lead to a huge reduction in cardiac output. And that's what we see happening is for these patients, because we have the inability to contract effect uh, effectively, we're going to see a reduction in cardiac output. So when we look at the amount of blood that's coming out of the ventricle and into the aorta, we see a reduction or decreased cardiac output. Now, what happens when we have a reduction in cardiac output is we're going to activate compensatory mechanisms. You can see I've drawn a flowchart over here that kind of leads us through this. So we activate compensatory mechanisms. We're going to see that this reduction in cardiac output and a subsequent reduction of blood pressure are going to be uh, recognized by a number of different compensatory mechanisms. One of the first is going to be the baroreceptors. So we'll have that uh, decrease in cardiac output recognized by our baroreceptors. And those baroreceptors are pretty rapidly going to support a sympathetic nervous system response. We know the sympathetic nervous system is going to do a couple of things. One is we'll activate our beta-1 receptors in the heart and attempt to increase heart rate. So one of the things we'll see in response to this is the heart will try to beat faster. One of the other things that we're going to get is activation of our alpha-1 receptors in the periphery. So alpha-1 receptors in the periphery are going to lead to peripheral vasoconstriction. So we're going to constrict the peripheral vessels. So these gray lines will mark our vasoconstriction and attempt to shunt blood back to the uh, heart. So we're going to get uh, vasoconstriction. And again, the purpose of this is can I shunt blood away from the periphery? and into the core in order to increase preload for the heart. So one of the jobs or one of the compensatory mechanisms we're gonna see here is an attempt to push blood, or we have vasoconstriction, which is going to push blood back into the heart, into our right ventricle, hopefully allowing for more stretch and output. So one of the compensatory mechanisms that we'll see is an increase in preload through vasoconstriction. One of the compensatory mechanisms we're gonna see is an increase in heart rate uh, through activation of beta-1 receptors, Activation of those beta-1 receptors are also going to try to increase contractility, but that's a big problem for this patient because we know they can't really contract any harder. So uh, baroreceptor response uh, from the sympathetic nervous system is going to do things like activate our beta-1 and alpha-1 uh, receptors, which are going to lead to an increased heart rate and an increase in vasoconstriction. Over the longer term, we can see things like... Um, our uh, renal cells recognizing that the blood pressure is dropping and you can get activation of items like the RAS and ADH system. 
which are going to lead to vasoconstriction uh, and retention of fluid on their own. So um, we'll almost compound these by seeing a little bit more vasoconstriction and we'll also get some uh, fluid retention. And those are going to work through very, uh, through very similar mechanisms in which I will increase uh, my preload in order to try and uh, manage some of this. So what we see, end up seeing is a lot of uh, increase in vasoconstriction as a core uh, compensatory mechanism here. I want to keep blood pressure high to try to perfuse those organs or blood pressure higher to perfuse the organs. We get an increase in heart rate and an attempt to increase contractility. But we know at the end of the day, this is one of the big problems is I can't increase contractility. Now, the problem that exists here is twofold. One is that I have shut down blood supply or perfusion to the periphery. So I vasoconstrict, which is subsequently going to lead to decreased oxygenation or decreased blood supply to the periphery. So this vasoconstriction has a consequence. I'm going to decrease uh, blood flow and subsequently oxygen delivery to the peripheral tissues. So that will have a consequence. The other consequence is as we vasoconstrict and we cause an increase in blood pressure or systemic vascular resistance, we increase our afterload. And afterload is the basically the pressure in which the left ventricle has to pump against. So you can picture this as essentially being the barrier that the left ventricle has to overcome in order to eject blood. So uh, the the ventricle has to eject enough pressure to overcome the pressure in the system in order to actually get, get blood to move forward. If you picture two people pushing on each other, one person has to eventually exert more force to push the other person over. So that is our afterload. So the problem with the activation of these comp uh, compensatory mechanisms is they're going to increase systemic vascular resistance, which is going to increase afterload. So one of the consequences we see is we increase afterload. And that's an issue for a patient, especially someone who's having a myocardial infarction or someone who, who has congestive heart failure and has damage to their left ventricle over a long period of time. Because if I increase afterload, well, I already have a heart that is not contracting well. So if I increase the pressure in which my left ventricle has to overcome to eject blood, the problem is that if I have a whole bunch of uh, or a big reduction in contractility and I cannot eject blood or I can't increase pressure, I'm not going to be able to um, have output or I'm going to overburden my myocardium to a point where it can no longer eject blood. And that's what we see in someone who's having a myocardial infarction who cannot or who ends up in cardiogenic shock is one of the problems is we increase afterload too much. A left ventricle that's already failing with contractility cannot overcome the afterload. And as a result, we start to see falling cardiac output or cardiac output starts to fall. The other consequence we have to be concerned about, so that's one way in which we see a reduction in blood pressure, but the other way that we see a reduction in blood pressure or the uh, consequence number two that we see, so we'll say that this is what, number one. So consequence number two is that we are going to see the effects or the uh, problems that come from having basically destruction of our peripheral cells. So as we reduce blood flow to these peripheral cells and we don't supply them with oxygenation, the natural process of cell death starts to happen and what happens in a response to cell death starts to occur. And the response to this is we start to see an immune response. Um, so we see things like uh, tissue ne necrosis factor being released and we see the release of interleukins. The other consequence to this is these dead or dying cells release nitrous oxide. And we know that the release of our inflammatory mediators as well as nitrous oxide are going to cause vasodilation. So what ends up happening to these patients is these peripheral vessels that were vasoconstricted now become vasodilated and we get increase in permeability. So as these vessels dilate and become more permeable, so uh, we can see this here and that the consequence number two is that peripheral, we get peripheral vasodilation. And with that vasodilation comes an increase in permeability. And now the problem is that we are going to have a challenges with blood flow because as we vasodilate, we know it's going to decrease pressure and we can actually start to see fluid shifting into the periphery and the patient will start to enter that shock state.
So one of the big problems here is that, um, or the second consequence that we should be concerned about is that this patient is going to have uh, vasodilation as the periphery becomes uh, too ischemic and those cells start to die. So a couple big consequences as we try to compensate for shock, especially if we don't correct the underlying problem. So one of the reasons why PCI is so important and reperfusion is so important is because we need this ventricle to be able to contract well again in order to prevent these two consequences from leading to cardiogenic shock. So let's walk through that in this flowchart form. We're talking about the 5-10% of patients who have an infarction who end up in cardiogenic shock. This is because they have a decrease in contractility, which is going to impair cardiac output. So as the ventricle can't contract, I can't generate the stroke volume I need, my output falls. In order to compensate for that output, things like baroreceptors, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and ADH are going to be released. And we're going to see things like an increase in heart rate, an increase in vasoconstriction, and an attempt to increase contractility in an already failing ventricle. All of these things together increase workload. These compensatory mechanisms, although designed to maintain cardiac output and perfusion, are going to cause a heart to work harder that's already not receiving enough oxygen. So um, it's going to be a perpetual cycle towards uh, this, this infarction getting worse. That's one of the problems. The other problem with this increase in vasoconstriction is that it increases afterload, or it increases the pressure that the left ventricle has to create to overcome the pressure in the system, which will overburden the myocardium. So it puts the myocardium at risk, again, of having to work too hard when it's already not receiving enough oxygen uh, to not have ischemia and infarction. And this will lead to, to poor output. So I guess to a point where this left ventricle cannot overcome this afterload. So we compensate too much, the afterload rises too much, and the ventricle as conduct or contractility reduces too much. I can't overcome the afterload, so I don't have enough force to open those valves or overcome the pressure in the system, and I can't have output, so my blood pressure falls. The other problem is that as this is ongoing, this vasoconstriction is purposely shunting blood away from the periphery. So these peripheral tissues are becoming ischemic. And when those peripheral tissues become ischemic and die, they do what ischemic and dying tissues do. Is they release uh, tissue factors, so things like uh, interleukins and um, our, uh, our uh, nitrous oxide. And we're going to end up uh, having an inflammatory response. So as we release this tissue necrosis factor, interleukins and nitrous oxide, that's going to promote an inflammatory response. And what our vessels do in uh, response to uh, these mediators is they vasodilate. So we get vasodilation as our second consequence, which leads to uh, a decrease in blood pressure because we've had that vasodilation and we're going to see uh, fluid exiting or we're going to get fluid shifting, which will further reduce blood pressure. So basically, our comp story mechanisms work to a point, but if we don't correct the problem, the patient is going to end up uh, having a drastic reduction in blood pressure as a result. So that's how we end up in cardiogenic shock. Essentially, our body uses compensatory mechanisms to try to increase perfusion, but if I don't correct the underlying problem, a heart that is failing will continue to fail, or these compensatory mechanisms will actually push that heart further towards failure. Um, and then we'll have this reduction in blood pressure. So one of the reasons why intervention is so important. Some of the things to consider for this patient is the first line treatment will be fluid. So about 50% of patients who are experiencing cardiogenic shock will respond to aggressive fluid therapy. And one of the reasons for that is because, especially we're looking at someone with a left ventricular infarct here, the right ventricle uh, is a little less adaptive to pressure afterload and can tolerate more volume. So if I can push more fluid in or I can really try to use this preload to generate more output, um, the right ventricle can adapt a little bit more to that. So although I'm pushing more fluid into the system, my right ventricle can stretch a little bit more um, and it's more tolerant of volume overload. So it can try to help increase output without overburdening a right ventricle with the increase in preload. So we can try to manage some of that output. So for that reason, fluid is typically one of the first things we want to do for someone in cardiogenic shock. Um, aggressive fluid therapy, try to support this right ventricle that can, can adapt a little bit more to um, that volume or volume overload and can start pushing uh, what is necessary into the left ventricle to jet, try to generate a bit more output. So fluid as our first line of treatment, uh, and then second line of treatment, you're going to use uh, things like epinephrine or catecholamines or vasopressors.